Okay, so I'll start recording today's lecture. Yeah. Okay, so um, any questions on on the lectures from last week? No? All right. So what did we cover? We, we looked at a simple, somewhat special model of uh, consumers or households and firms. So households allocate a, a scarce budget uh, to buy various goods they're in, interested in. And uh, firms uh, choose their supplies to, to maximize their profits. Uh, and we are doing partial equilibrium analysis, meaning we are focusing on one particular good and the market for that good. And everything else is kind of lumped as, you know, from the consumer's perspective as a, a composite good of other commodities, right, which is captured in the money spent on those commodities. So we develop the notions of, you know, demand and supply functions, uh, each coming from uh, an optimization problem. And then when we put together these demand and supply functions, the basic classic Walrasian model of a market is that uh, prices will always adjust so that demand and supply are equal, right? So that's our market clearing condition. And that's the main predictive device about uh, how, how markets will behave. Now, I want to get into a little bit of discussion about you know, uh, comparative statics exercises. And these exercises basically are of a general nature. They say, okay, here's a model. What if the, how does the, how, how do the endogenous variables in the model change or shift when some exogenous variable or parameter shifts, right? So when we are looking at a market model, our ingredients are the demand and supply functions. And that gives rise to an equilibrium price and quantity, which we uh, uh, talked about last time. Quantity with me. And uh, and, and so uh, let's see how we can think about or analyze how the market will respond to various uh, kinds of exogenous shifts or changes in parameters. Um, so first, let's think of, you know, uh, let's say a, a demand shock or a taste shock to consumers. So consumers, one factor which determines uh, how much consumers will buy is, of course, the price of the good. But there are many other factors, right? Uh, there can be uh, taste changes so that even at the same price, people may want to buy more or want to buy less. Okay, so suppose, uh, you know, um, uh, there's, a, there's a taste shock. So let's take the current situation. Um, you know, uh, people, because of the pandemic, because of the virus uh, and the fear of getting infected, uh, certain kinds of uh, services are, are affected, right? Uh, so eating out, uh, the restaurant business has been badly hit. Yeah, uh, people are um, afraid of, of going to restaurants and sitting in crowded places to, next to other people. So how do we capture that? Yeah. Um, so, so one way which you're, you know, those of you who have studied all this at the undergraduate level, it's just bread and butter perhaps to you, uh, but we can draw pictures, yes? So let's draw a typical demand supply diagram. Uh, so we have price and we have quantity. And we have our demand curve and our supply curve. Okay, so if what we are talking about is the fact that consumers have become afraid of eating out, uh, then in terms of the picture, how do we capture that situation? First of all, uh, again, many of you may be familiar with, if, if for example, uh, the price of the good is here at some point for whatever reason, 
and the price uh, falls to P2, yes, then quantity demanded will increase from, oops, I don't know what's happening. Oh God. Uh, Oh, this thing is a little messed up. Let me try and fix this. So you can use the eraser. Yeah, I can. So you, you can simply undo the last few annotations. I can undo, but something uh, made this ultra sensitive. So that's also okay. I think it's back on track. Uh, oh, I accidentally pressed some button. Um, all right. So uh, key one, and then that increases to. Q2, yes. Now, this movement is uh, called the movement along the curve, right? We move from point A to B. So movements along the curve capture the effect of change in the price of the good itself. Here, the uh, price of the good fell from P1 to P2, and the change is captured by moving from point A to point B, right? So, so that kind of change and the consumer's response to changing the price of the good is captured by movement along the curve. Now, when something other than the price of the good changes and demand changes in response to that, that is captured by a shift of the curve itself, right? So, uh, so over here, let me use a different color. So what we are talking about uh, that because of the pandemic, consumers have developed cold feet so they're not going out and uh, uh, eating out as much as uh, they used to. So that means that even if the price did not change, let's say, so uh, at a previous price like P2, they were buying Q2, but now suppose they're buying Q1 because some of them don't want to eat out anymore, right? But then there are other brave souls who, who want to do so. So that means that every price, there is less demand for the good than, than before the pandemic. So that will be captured by a new demand curve, uh, which lies to the left of the original demand curve, right? So the demand curve has shifted to the left. Now, with the old demand curve, we had an equilibrium price, which is here, P star, and an equilibrium quantity, which is uh, here. Um, and um, with the new one, we have a new point of intersection between demand and supply curves, which is over here. And so you can see from the picture that the new equilibrium price is lower, P double star, and the new equilibrium quantity is also lower, Q double star. Right? So, in simple cases, we can do this sort of a diagrammatic analysis, which you're very familiar with, and that tells us using uh, the theory of uh, market equilibrium, uh, what will be the effect of something like this, right? That, that uh, there's a, a taste shock to consumers. Um, now, um, and, you know, in a pandemic, Obviously, some other products, some other goods and services uh, have received the opposite kind of taste shock, actually. Uh, so what is an example where consumers, instead of buying less of the good, is buying more of it? Sanitizers. Masks. Sanitizers, masks, online retail, I think, has, has you know, if you look at uh, Amazon, Amazon has gone on a hiring spree across the world. They have, across the world, after the start of the pandemic, they've hired almost half a million people. Yeah, uh, that, that's amazing. In India, they've gone on a hiring spree. If you look at Amazon stock prices, 
uh, they, the last I checked, they were up about 25%. Uh, Jeff Bezos, the, uh, one of the main owners, uh, founder of Amazon, has uh, now his net worth is uh, significantly north of uh, $100 billion. Uh, he's the richest man in the world now. Uh, so, so it's not like, you know, all mark, all goods and services have received negative demand shocks. Some have received positive demand shocks. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's talk about another market and possible uh, impact on such markets, not pandemic, stepping outside the pandemic. Another major global market uh, is the oil market, right? The crude oil. Uh, and if you look at the last uh, four or five years, there have been significant uh, changes in, in the price of crude oil. At some point, there were more than $100, you know, $100 a barrel, and then it fell to, I think, $30. Uh, so, so the wild, wild swings, and now they're going back up again. So, um, okay, and now, uh, you know, at the time when uh, oil crude prices were going up in that inflationary period a few years back, uh, there were a lot of articles in newspapers, in, in the press, in the media, uh, speculating why there's a sort of dramatic increase. Yeah, um, and so one kind of reason suggested was that, oh, it's coming from the demand side because India, China, the, the emerging economies are growing fast. So the demand for energy is going up at a, at a pretty uh, high rate from these countries. And that's what pushing uh, crude prices up. Uh, now, the other sort of um, explanation that was being provided was that, you know, um, uh, these are supply shocks uh, because uh, of maybe cartelization, maybe many, many of the producers are, are getting together and restricting the supply and that's what this is, this is doing. Or maybe some of the costs of production have gone up because of environmental regulation, carbon taxes, and so on. So, so let's try to see, take each of these proposed uh, factors. One is a demand side shock and the other is supply side shock and see uh, in our pictures, how, how they will look like, yeah? So first let's take the demand shocks, right? That, that there's, uh, because of fast economic growth in some major economies, uh, there's, at the same price, consumers are willing to buy more crude oil. So how do we capture that? Well, similar to the previous picture. Ah, uh, oops. So our demand supply curves, and now I shift the demand curve to the right. Yes. So now we go from um, these equilibrium prices P1 and Q1 to P2 and Q2. Right. So yes. Theory tells us that if there was this sort of demand shock, um, indeed prices will go up. So that could be a possible explanation of, of rising prices. Now, what if there was a supply side shock, for example, OPEC uh, had a meeting and decided to restrict supply, or maybe costs went up for various reasons for certain uh, oil producers. So, How do I need to shift my curves? Supply curve will shift upwards. So supply curve will move to the left, right? Yeah, yeah. Upwards or to the left, basically at the same price as before, there, there will be less supply than before, right? Because of higher costs or cartelization or what have you. Uh, and here again, what is the prediction that uh, the new equilibrium point? So this is comparative statics, right? You 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 compare the new equilibrium point, which is here, uh, with the old equilibrium point. So you compare B against A. So how do they compare? Well, 
P1, Q1, and the new values are P2, Q2. So once again, indeed, our pictures tell us that if there's a supply shock of this kind, prices will go up. So that would also be an explanation, right? But what is the big difference between the two pictures? The quantity. The quantity, the volume of trade, right? So, so if we are trying to distinguish between these rival explanations uh, to uh, what we need to look at is data on volumes, right? Um, whether that has been going up or going down, that'll, that'll help us understand whether the shock is coming from more from the demand side or from the supply side. Yes? Now, these pictures and all you're familiar with, let's do the corresponding maths, okay? Because some, often the problem won't be this simple. You maybe have, <clears throat> try to analyze uh, several markets at once, or there may be you know, more complicated factors you're bringing into these markets. Uh, so, so you can't always uh, get the answer just by drawing pictures because the picture becomes too complicated or cumbersome. So we need to see the corresponding mathematical technique. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Sushant, yeah, go ahead. Sir, for, 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 for the supply curve, yeah. uh, the leftward shift and the upward shift are, are same? That's right. I mean, there are just two different ways of looking at the same shift or the same change. Right. Leftward shift, shift means that for the same price, uh, less supply is forthcoming. Upward shift means that to uh, extract the same supply from producers, uh, the market now has to pay a higher price than before. Yes, but it's, it's just two okay, different ways of looking at the same uh, thing. All right, so now let's go to the uh, maths of it, okay? We'll do the same thing. We'll run through the same logic, but using our uh, mathematical tools, yeah. not drawing pictures anymore. Um, All right, um, so we start with the basic uh, equilibrium equation, right? Demand equals supply, that's what characterizes e equilibrium. Uh, P star is the equilibrium price. So the moment I use the equilibrium price in this equation, it becomes an identity, okay? P star is precisely that value makes, which makes sure uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side are equal, okay? Now, the way I've written it, I have thrown in two parameters being somewhat abstract, alpha, and beta. So alpha is a parameter sitting inside the demand function. Beta is a parameter sitting inside the supply function. So I'm, I'm being parsimonious and compact over here. I'm not specifying what exactly alpha, beta are, but there could be a whole range of things. So for example, alpha could capture some sort of consumer taste, exactly what we were talking about, with the interpretation that if I increase alpha, then for the same price, consumers demand more so that so, so that under that interpretation, an increase in alpha is exactly the same as a, a rightward shift of the demand curve in our pictures. Yeah, uh, but alpha could be also other things. Alpha could be, for example, changing the price of some other good. Yes. Uh, so, if this is demand for cars and alpha is the price of petrol, then if alpha goes up, then then you know this could deliver a negative demand shock, um, and so on. Um, and similarly, on the supply side, beta can be a whole range of different things. Beta could be some cost of production, for example, which lowers supply. Um, uh, it could be new innovation, new discoveries, which lower the cost of production and increases supply. So we can interpret uh, alpha and beta uh, in various ways. Okay. But they are shift parameters. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Uh, so sorry to interrupt. Uh, sir, alpha can so uh, negative demand shock and positive demand shock simultaneously. No, we have to define it. I'm saying that, you know, we have a, this alpha and beta gives us a handle to, to talk about or analyze negative, positive demand shocks or anything of that sort, right? So I, I just have to define it one, uh, one way. Uh, so in the exercise that we're going to do, let's, let's define alpha in the following way, that if alpha 
is, is, a, is a favorable test, taste parameter. So if alpha goes up, that means consumers are more inclined towards buying this good. So that means it will increase demand, right? We could have defined it the other way too, that increase in alpha, alpha represents instead of enthusiasm for the product, we could talk about alpha representing caution or, or suspicion about the product, about its safety, about its uh, usefulness and so on. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so, so let's ask the question. Let's forget about beta for now. We'll hold that constant. What if alpha goes up and alpha is a, is a positive taste shock, let's say. Yeah. Now, since this is, again, we'll fall back to the cold trick that we uh, also saw earlier in these uh, lectures that once I am defining this P as the equilibrium price P star, right? This is an identity. And then I can equate, I can take derivatives, for example, with respect to alpha, because now we're talking of, you know, alpha having shifted. So if alpha shifts, what is the effect? I can take derivatives of both sides with respect to alpha and equate them. Yeah. So that's what I've done over here. Uh, you know, on the left hand side, everybody's familiar with the notation, right? Q sub alpha means del Q del alpha. It's the partial derivative with respect to alpha of this function. This function has two uh, arguments now. So uh, if I'm differentiating with respect to alpha, this is first is the partial derivative. Alpha itself directly is an, uh, is an argument of this function, right? So this takes care of that part. How much? If P didn't change, only, only the direct effect of the change in alpha is captured in this partial derivative, right? But keep in mind that uh, P star will also change as we change alpha, right? The equilibrium itself shifts. So that is captured in this second because P star itself is now going to be a function of alpha. So, so this derivative of the left-hand side will have a second term, which you will have to use chain rule, right? First, we differentiate Q with respect to P star, and then we differentiate P itself with respect to alpha. Right? And it's the product of the two. The way to think about it is this is the direct effect of the change in uh, the taste shock, right? If, if the market did not adjust, if prices held at the previous levels, then this is how, by how much demand will shift, yes? And this is the indirect effect of the change in alpha. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, alpha induces some change in prices and that in turn affects consumer demand to some extent, right? So this is the direct effect on demand. This is the indirect effect on demand. Yes. Um, on the right hand side, things are more simple. Uh, alpha is not itself an argument of the function. However, alpha will have some effect on supply through an indirect channel, namely that to the extent alpha changes the market price P star, uh, this is the effect on supply, right? So again, chain rule. Uh, first, we differentiate with respect to P star and then differentiate P star itself with respect to alpha, right? So the effect on supply, uh, one second, let me just finish okay. this. Okay. So uh, the effect on supply only comes through the indirect channel. The effect on demand comes through both the direct channel and the indirect channel. And now if you think of the picture, this is precisely the situation where uh, if I, if I Go back to the picture. So if you look at the picture here, uh, because supply only has an indirect effect through price changes, that's why the supply curve, sorry, this is the picture, relevant picture here. So the supply curve hasn't moved. Okay, so the supply curve is, is in place. Now, the demand curve, if you look at the original situation, the demand was Q1, all right? Uh, now, if the price remained at P1, then the change in demand would have been this amount, okay? That's what the first part of your uh, partial, uh, of your derivative is capturing. However, as an impact of this, all these shifts, the price does go, go up and that increase in price chokes off some of the increased demand, right? It brings in it back in this direction to some extent by, by this amount. 
Okay, so this amount is the indirect effect of, of the change in consumer taste. Part of it translates into higher prices and that chokes off some of the uh, direct effect. Yes. Okay. You Please repeat one. this uh, once again, the direct and indirect effects. Well, first of all, intuitively, when there's a taste shock, right? Consumers want to buy more of a product. Um, masks or sanitizers because of safety concerns they want to buy more of those or because of economic growth they want to consume more energy all these examples that we talked about right so the taste shock first of all uh, we can break down the effect on consumers in in two components right one we can ask the question okay if market prices did not change if they remained at the own level how much extra will consumers want to buy because of their taste shock, right? So that's our direct effect. Mathematically, that's this partial derivative. Yes? Okay. Sir. And in terms of pictures, that's this interval going from here to there because we are going along the same price line, right? So, <clears throat> Now, what is the indirect effect? Well, because of this extra pressure coming from consumers that will create some increase in market price eventually. And that higher price will choke off some of the initial surge in demand, right? Because yes, consumers are more enthusiastic about the product, but they're facing higher prices. It's also become more expensive. And some of that extra demand will be cut back because of that, right? And that is what this indirect effect is. The second term is capturing. Del Q del P times DP D alpha, right? Alpha creates some change in price and that change in price creates this amount of uh, adjustment of demand. And uh, the same concept in terms of diagrams is captured in, you know, in this picture, if you look, uh, prices have gone up from P1 to P2 right? If they remained at P1, consumers would have bought this amount. But since it had gone up to P2, they're buying only this amount. So this reduction is the indirect effect of, of the demand shock, right? And, <coughs> excuse me. All right. So now that we have this thing in place, Notice that uh, this is a simple equation where what we're interested in is dp star d alpha. What is the effect of change in this taste parameter on market prices? So we can solve for dp star d alpha from this equation very easily, right? It's a simple linear equation. So when we solve, we get this expression, right? So this is an expression consisting of all the partial derivatives of the demand and supply functions, yeah? Now, can we put a sign on this expression? Can we say it's, if it's positive or negative? First of all, look at the denominator. This is the slope of the supply curve, which at least in our simple framework is positive, at least slope. And this is the slope of the demand curve. So QP is negative and there's a minus sign in front of it. So the entire denominator is positive, yes? Now, what about the numerator? Well. That's del Q del alpha. Now we can, we are free to define it either way, but we are thinking of alpha as some sort of enthusiasm uh, or proclivity to consume this good, right? For whatever reason. So let's take DQ del Q del alpha to be positive, okay? So, uh, so alpha is a, is a positive demand shock, right? Higher values of alpha mean uh, more favorable demand conditions. So, uh, so we have a ratio of a positive thing and a positive thing. So, so this whole thing is positive, right? So when there's a positive taste shock, we have concluded from our maths, uh, prices have to go up. Yes, this is exactly what we con concluded with uh, what we saw in the pictures, right? But I'm showing you this mathematical technique of doing comparative statics because you know it's a much more powerful tool which you can apply to much more complicated models and still get an answer where you won't be able to draw the picture. 
what about quantity? That's pretty easy. Um, Uh, so can you please explain why will the denominator be positive? The denominator is the slope of the supply curve minus the slope of the demand curve, right? So slope, yeah. slope of the supply curve is positive, slope of the demand curve is negative. You're supply, uh, subtracting a negative number from a positive number. Okay, okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, uh, Sir? yes. Yes, Sushant. Go ahead, sir, sir. In that, sir, in that e equation, yeah, uh, the, sir, the second one equation, second equation, uh, uh for the LHS side, uh, left hand side, uh, you related the changes in with the graph. So, what is the changes in the RHS show? The change in the okay, you want me to relate the right hand side to the graph? Yes. All right. Uh, okay. So this is the relevant picture. Uh, first of all, when alpha changes, consumer taste shift, there's no direct effect on the supply curve, right? Because it's completely the other side, other set of players. So that's why the supply curve hasn't shifted. So the zero direct effect is captured by the fact that the supply curve is staying firm in its same place. Okay. Now, the supply curve also. Uh, however, uh, the supply is affected through an indirect effect, meaning through the channel of prices. So had prices remained at P1, supply would have stayed put at the old value Q1, okay? But, um, uh, but prices have gone up to P2. So if you move up the supply curve to P2, that gives you this amount of demand, uh, so, sorry, this amount of supply. Okay, so the entire change in supply is coming because of the price rise. And in the maths, it's being captured by this derivative. The in, this is the indirect effect. It's telling us that whatever, at the end of the day, by whatever amount supply changes, it's coming purely through the effect on prices, right? It is, it is entirely because of you know, the change in prices in the market. All right. Yes. Sir. So, so just a minor doubt. Can I ask? Sure. Uh, so this equation del Q by del alpha yeah. plus del Q by del P. Yeah. Just needed a clarification. Will it be del Q by del P star or P only? P star, I mean, that's just notation or semantics, right? So P is the variable. And okay. P star is a particular value of the variable, right? Oh. So, so when I'm writing del Q, del P, I don't want to use p star you know i want to write it more generally that you know what is the what is the as, as p changes at a certain point but this partial derivative is being evaluated at a particular value and that particular value is whatever p star is right so that's why i'm careful to write p star inside the function as as, as its argument Thanks. yeah um all right struggling a little, toggling with between various windows and uh, uh, mouse pads. All right. Uh, what happens to equilibrium quantity? Well, you know, you can just uh, uh, look at uh, either side, either the left hand side or right hand side to answer that question. Right hand side is simpler because it has only one term. So uh, the right hand side captures the change in supply as the taste shock hits, yes. Uh, so it's the this XP, this partial derivative times DP star D alpha. So we have already calculated DP star D alpha, so we need to plug it in here, right? Uh, and, and when you do that, you get the this expression, right? Uh, it's multiplied by uh, the slope of the supply curve. And um, since the slope, slope of the supply curve is positive, Therefore, this, this uh, comparative static effect on quantity also turns out to be positive. Right? This is again what we saw in the graph, that with a uh, 
outward shift of the demand curve, both equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity goes up. Same conclusion through the maths, right? But this is how the maths is done. All right. Um, the other case when you have a uh, shock from the supply side, um, same technique. So I won't repeat it. You you can you know you can again uh, do the maths and relate it to the diagram that we drew. Okay, so I'll I'll leave that to you. Any questions? Is is the method clear? Right? Because this is widely used and it, it's important for you to sort of get a good grasp on what the logic of comparative statics is, how we approach the problem, how we calculate these, these effects. So, um, okay, let's go one by one, Sagar, yes. Yes, sir. so the P star here in the equation, it is a variable or it is fixed, P star. P star, see, P is the originally the variable, okay? So in the most general sense, P is the variable. Now, P star is fixed if we fix alpha and beta. Once we fix the parameters, P star is a specific value, all right? So in that sense, P star is fixed. Now, we are doing comparative statics exercises. So we'll be changing from time to time, we'll be changing the values of alpha, beta themselves, the parameters. And when we do that, at that point, P star itself starts responding to that, okay? So P star is fixed for a given alpha, beta, <clears throat> but P star is a variable once we allow alpha, beta to change. Once we do that, then P star becomes a function of alpha and beta. So the answer to your question is both yes and no. It depends on the context, right? Fixing alpha, beta, it's fixed, it's unchanging. When you allow the parameters to vary, P star changes in response to those parameters. Then it becomes a variable and a function of those parameters. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Um, sir, in the previous slide, yeah. um, it's a basic question. Since it was an equilibrium, not an identity, why right. have we equated? Derivatives. Is it because the functions are linear? No, 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 no. This is very important to understand. See, uh, I, I hope all of this does not sound like mysticism. Okay. See, when we first talk about the equilibrium condition, okay, it's demand equals supply, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if I wrote just a general p inside the functions, then I'm I'm writing an equation. Right. Only for a particular value of p will this equality be true. If I throw in some random value of p, the, the two sides won't match. Now, then having found that value of p for which demand supply are equal, uh, and having found that for every alpha and beta, right, then we can say that we can define p star as precisely the solution to this equation. Okay. Now, once we write it in that manner, we write the equation, but inside is the solution to the equation itself. At that point, it becomes an identity. Yes? Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yes. Right? So it is okay. only after taking that logical step that we go ahead and take start taking derivatives and equating them. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, so let's now go beyond all this abstraction and let's talk about a simple uh, example okay an application um, just to show you that <clears throat> uh, even these simple concepts which again is almost revision for you except that you know i'm uh, making it a little more rigorous and you're seeing the sort of the full mathematical artillery with which we try to answer these these questions but nevertheless concepts of you know simple demand supply market equilibrium would be bread and butter to to all of you who have come from economics backgrounds but let's see whether they can be useful in understanding sort of complex interesting real world problems um, um, okay so blood ivory um, let's talk about poaching yes poaching is a big problem in india you know we must have uh, uh, followed uh, the reports that come out Kaziranga has a huge problem because poachers, you know, there's a demand for 
uh, rhino horns. So rhinos get killed by poachers and then there's fights between the poachers and, and the uh, security guards. Um, tigers, <laughs> tiger poaching is another big problem. So some of our most uh, prestigious uh, animals are, are threatened uh, because of the black market in their body parts. Uh, the, here I'm going to talk about the African case. Um, elephants are killed for their tusks. Um, and so in the, so this is a very sad picture of a, of a dead elephant. And these are forest guards who, are, who have discovered the carcass. Um, yeah, so uh, the, <clears throat> so there, there, there's this cat and mouse game between the poachers and uh, you know, forest officials. Um, now often forest officials manage to intercept the poachers as they're uh, doing their dirty business and they capture uh, these elephant tusks from them. So they have put them in warehouses. So this is a picture, typical picture of a government warehouse where uh, captured tusks are kept. Now, the question is when these stockpiles build up, right? When a government has a warehouse full of these things, what do they do with it? Okay. Here's one thing they can do with it. They can allow a sale on the, on the market, uh, catering to consumer demand and, and allowing the tusks to be converted into ivory products. Here's another thing they often do with it. Yeah, They burn it, they destroy it. And often they call in the press to do it publicly. Yeah. Um, let me give you a little more background just to just to give you a sense of the importance and the magnitude of the problem, right? If you go back to the decade of the 1980s, <clears throat> uh, the Africa in that one single decade, the African elephant population was about halved, right, from 1.3 million to 600,000. So that's a dramatic, dramatic decrease, right? So if you love wildlife, this should really, really concern you. Uh, the annual ivory trade was more than a billion dollars in 1980s, right? So this is in the contemporary uh, dollar value. So current value would be even higher. And in case you were wondering, more a vast majority of that uh, elephant trade was coming from fresh kills, right? Uh, newly killed elephants and their tasks, not, not the old stock. <clears throat> uh, so in 1989, towards the end of the decade, you know, countries of the world got together and formed this body, the sites body, to try and put in some regulation and some restrictions and try to stop this massacre. Uh, now, then, as I said, many of these countries were, uh, which face this problem, countries like Kenya, Uganda, Tanganyika, and so on, which has their African elephant populations, uh, they started accumulating all this, uh, all these tusks, right? And from time to time, they would appeal to this body, this international body, to allow them to sell it. They said, you know, we'll, we can make good use of the revenues. We need the money. So there are instances where countries have been allowed to go ahead and sell. But there are other instances where their application was turned down. It was denied. And there are other instances where countries voluntarily on their own uh, burned their stock. Right? They destroy it instead of trying to sell it. So the question is, from a policy perspective, what's the right thing to do? Okay, uh, Should sites, the international body, allow the sale? Will that be a good thing? Should countries try to sell or should they try to destroy it and burn it and, and not sell it, right? Which is the right way to go? Now, of course, the right policy, the right way to go would depend on what our objectives are naturally, right? If your objectives are to help the poachers, that's a different question. But presumably most people will be sympathetic to the cause of the elephants. So, so let's take it as a given that our objective is to protect elephants. So what kind of policy will promote that? Uh, allow the sale or not allow the sale? Okay, so that's the question. Anybody wants to pitch in and, and tell us what you think and why? So I think uh, uh, it would be perhaps better to uh, auction off uh, these stockpiles as it uh, makes sense that uh, it's a sunk cost. There is nothing that can be done about it. 
and uh, the revenues that come in uh, can be used perhaps to enhance conservation efforts as, as is done in several parts in Africa, for example, where they in, in fact have uh, uh, made, uh, uh, made, made it lawful to have gaming reserves. So something along similar lines where uh, additional revenues that are brought in helps the conservatism efforts. Okay. Uh, two two good points. One, one, one is that you know it's it's bygones are bygones. I mean these elephants have already been killed. They're not going to come back. So uh, that's one thing. And the other thing, as Gunjan said, is that well there can be some positive uses of the sales revenue. So Kenya sells its stockpile, and with the money they can hire more forest guards. Maybe yeah. So um, any other argument? Somebody wants to argue in the opposite direction. So uh, I think this is more of a game where you put out an information out there. So the moment you start selling it, it's a uh, green signal for every every other poacher that it, it's allowed and it's not taken very strictly. So it's about like, you know, if you burn it, it's a threat uh, for the country and it will provide less incentive for further poachers. If you get caught, your products would be sold, will be burned, sorry. Okay, so, so you, you're looking, you're thinking of the signaling part of it, right? That somehow... And we would probably want to understand it a little better, that channel. But somehow, uh, allowing the sale signals softness that that uh, governments, international bodies, uh, the world community is not as serious about protecting the elephants. And, and that will embolden the poachers and the buyers, maybe, maybe, right? But we should sort of dig deeper into it. But you flag a potential problem. Over there. So, so if, if you could perhaps also expound on this uh, argument that someone just mentioned, uh, but wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't this be simply just a signaling uh, effect it would have? Because I mean, these are in no way going to embolden, perhaps, or they these are not going to uh, lax out the the uh, the restrictions that you are putting on the poachers or the kind of penalties you are putting on the poachers, as long as you have the the penalties as strong as they could be. Okay. These would perhaps not be, these would be just a signaling. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, if you think of that. So apart from the signaling thing, there's another way uh, how allowing the sale of ivory products, it could affect the demand and the preferences from the consumer side. So if the sale is allowed, there might be a greater demand for these ivory products uh, in the upcoming time. So that would further incentivize this, um, yeah, what we wanted to prohibit. Yeah, excellent. So so essentially, both Divesh and Ria, <clears throat> they have taken that idea of signaling and uh, they have sort of, uh, so, so Ria is saying that, you know, signal, it, there's, uh, there can be signaling to the poachers and the producers. Uh, but there can also be a signaling aspect to consumers, people who are thinking of buying ivory products, right? What inference will they draw? That's something that we need to think about. Sir, if I may add, there could also be a situation of a cobra effect as well. The Delhi cobra effect. Yeah, I mean, uh, the moment you put a price on it, there'll be artificial, like even a government has an incentive to send poachers out there just to gain more revenue. So the cobra effect, which uh, Sanjog is referring to is an actual thing which which happened i forget the time period where the government announced the prices for catching cobras right uh, this is this is long long before obviously the uh, cobra uh, the cobra population in delhi today is very, quite limited but uh, and and then one of the unintended consequences of that was that you know people were bringing cobras from outside and releasing it and then catching it for the price so instead of cobras Cobra population going down, this kind of went up in Delhi. Uh, that, that's the story, right, Sanjo? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, People started rearing cobras uh, right. in the same way it happened in Vietnam as well. They put a French people put out a uh, bounty on rats and people started uh, raising rats. Yeah. So, so this is, you know, really what in economics we try to do. We, you know, often the mistake which non economists do is that. They, they somehow think that, well, if we introduce a policy or a change, people's behavior, people will continue to behave the way that they were behaving previously, right? But the, the, if there's one thing that we as economic students are taught to, to, to be careful about is that every policy, every new regime 
creates changes in people's behavior. Everybody is trying to react and, and uh, we have to anticipate these, these behavior changes, right? And often the conclusion is quite different once you take into account the, the possible behavior changes. Okay, anyway, um, um, good number of <clears throat> uh, interesting points being raised here and I, I will address all of them, uh, but let me, <clears throat> or, okay, since I don't have too much time, I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, let me move ahead to one of the points I wanted to make, and then come back to some of the issues that you guys have raised, right? I have a slide for that. There's one argument, good argument for selling, right? It's not the only factor, not the only consideration, but <clears throat> usual demand supply forces will act in a way which uh, creates one argument for selling. So let me explain that to you. So suppose this is the original equilibrium, right? So we are talking about the black market for ivory coming from uh, elephants. Uh, for simplicity, we'll, we'll assume that this supply curve comes entirely 100% from new kills of elephants, not from older stock. Okay, so this is going to be the price and this is going to be the quantity, all of this quantity coming from uh, poachers killing elephants and selling them. Um, now, what if suddenly Kenya is allowed, allowed to uh, release its stockpile into this market, right? Which curve will shift? Supply, 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 supply curve. So the supply curve shift by an amount X, X is the size of Kenya's stockpile, right? So the new position is S prime. Now, first of all, what does it do to equilibrium? Well, price goes down P0 to P1. Quantity of trade goes up from Q0 to Q1. Okay. Now, quantity increasing means, does it mean that uh, more elephants are now being killed? No, because part of this extra volume is coming from, well, more than a part of it is coming from the older stock that Kenya was holding, which has now come into this market, right? So to understand what quantity of this, out of this Q1, how much is coming from fresh elephant skill, uh, kills, we have to subtract X from this Q1, right? And if we subtract X, that means we are going back to the old supply curve and reading off the quantity from there. So that's Q2, yeah? So the fresh kill of elephants actually falls from Q0 to Q2. Right, along with a price decrease. The idea is very simple. If you dump more into the market, that'll drive down the price, depress the price. That'll make poaching and killing elephants less profitable for, for these poachers, right? And that's going to discourage poaching to some extent. May, may not eliminate it, but make, making it less prof profitable by driving down the market price is certainly going to have a bit of a discouragement effect. Yeah, so that's one, uh, one definitely an important factor to keep in mind, and that would constitute an argument for selling. Yeah. Now, that's not the end of the story. So many of you raised other points. So let me go back to some of the other points. Um, some these are these are points which can reinforce the argument for selling. Yeah. Uh, and this has been mentioned by, by you guys. Uh, some costs, certainly, you know, this, this is in the past. Uh, one can imagine that with the sales revenue, Kenya and Uganda, whoever who are holding these stockpiles, they, they get, you know, these are poor countries, so they get extra revenue, and maybe they can spend it on development, either directly in, in you know, conservation, uh, but even if they spend on local communities, right? Um, there's this uh, 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 man-animal con kind of conflict, right? Where, where forests end and human habitation begins. And a lot of damage to both humans and animals come because of this conflict. Um, people, you know, they, they'll sort of lay traps for wild animals because they come and damage their crops and so on. So one of the things which conservationists have noted is that you know if, if local communities are given a stake in conservation, for example, if they're involved in the tourism business, et cetera, then they have a reason to try and protect the animals. On the other hand, if they're impoverished and if they're you know, uh, 
if, if they don't have good livelihood options, then they have uh, an incentive to join the poachers, maybe. Yeah. Um, now, but you can think of arguments against selling. Um, one thing is that enforcement, and I think so, somebody touched upon this a little bit. See, when it's clean, when you say, okay, ivory trade is illegal, period. Okay, no ifs and buts. Then it's easy to enforce. Anybody caught trying to sell or buy ivory is doing something illegal. But if you say, well, ivory trade is illegal on odd numbered days, <laughs> and uh, legal on even numbered days, or you have all kinds of qualifications that if it came from this source, then it's fine. But if it came from that source, uh, then it's illegal. Now again, that makes it very difficult to, to, to actually uh, enforce because who's going to check? It's difficult to check which source it came from, whether it came from Kenya's stockpile or from some poacher's stockpile. So, so it may weaken enforcement. That's something to worry about. Uh, sends the wrong message. See, this is no random product, right? I mean, there's some taboo on the product, right? For uh, wearing fur, buying ivory. Uh, and, and if you look at other markets, like, you know, in the West, uh, there, there are often movements like, you know, people want to buy fair trade coffee, for example. The idea being that if uh, coffee plantation workers are being paid, you know, if, if, if it's, it's labeled as fair trade coffee, only if the plantation workers are getting paid above some what people might deem as, as a good wage, yeah? So uh, some commodities have a moral dimension. You know, there's, there's moral debates around them. And so ivory is one of them. It's not like apples and bananas and, you know, uh, computers. Um, so, so we have to think about what is a moral message to consumers. Part of this fight is to discourage consumers from buying these products. So, so if it's not stark, if it's made, if there are various uh, loopholes and exceptions being allowed, maybe it's arguable that, that the message is that, you know, moral messages are most uh, uh, strong when they're stark, when the 10 commandments says, thou shall not kill. That's a very sharp moral message. If it says, thou shall not kill, except under these circumstances, then the, then the message weakens and, and maybe the impact is weaker. Uh, so, so one could think about that. Now, so what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that, look, uh, we can't give an absolute categorical answer. Yes. Um, there's a famous story that, you know, uh, American President uh, Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt is the one who, uh, brought in the New Deal, which in 1933, which, which you know, after the Depression uh, transformed the American economy and, and uh, made a much bigger role for government uh, through various social safety nets. Earlier, it used to be, before the Depression, it was much more laissez there. So Roosevelt is, is a major figure in, in American history. So Roosevelt uh, once said, the story goes, I mean, and God knows whether it's historical or not, uh, that he wanted to have a one-handed economist. Uh, and people were surprised, why do you want a one-handed economist? So he said, uh, every economist I consult always says, on the one hand this, on the other hand this, they don't tell me, or give me a clear advice about what I should do. Uh, everything is on the one hand, on the other hand, so I'm, I'm quite sick of it. So. On this issue, I'll be a two-handed economist because that's why we are, what we are trained to do. There are, see, he, theory always doesn't always give you very clean categorical answers that, okay, this is the right thing, that's the wrong thing. But it does help us sort out various forces and factors, yes. Uh, so what we've learned here is, is not conclusive, but I think it's useful, okay? this effect which I was talking about, and uh, none of you mentioned it, I think this is a major consideration to keep in mind that, well, if you allow for all these stockpiles, 
to if you dump them on the market, you you hit the poachers in one way, which is their bottom line. You you make the trade at least for a while relatively unprofitable, and then that's one way to sort of try and bring it down. But then there are these other countervailing reasons. Yes. So ultimately, if you want to answer a policy question like this, you probably have to bring in some data. You have to measure the sizes and the, of, of these effects, and and then use some value judgment to to you know come to a conclusion about whether the sale should be allowed or not. But breaking it down into these components is, I think, useful. Question. Uh, sir, I had a question. Uh... Uh, wouldn't uh, having some sort of a policy as it is with uh, typical goods that are perhaps considered sin goods in a society? I'm sorry. Uh, let me let me let me get my earphones. Okay. Go so, ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Dr. Ghosh, sir. So I had a question that uh, uh, perhaps uh, wouldn't, wouldn't the outcomes would be something similar uh, with the graph that you have shown if we were to follow a policy that is typically followed for uh, sin goods uh, in a typical society that is absolutely taxing them very heavily. Uh, wouldn't uh, the outcomes be similar to as perhaps auctioning of the stockpiles? And I would imagine uh, following a policy along those lines would enable uh, governments to uh, set certain rules and regulations uh, from bodies and perhaps regulate the trade in a much more fair manner and at the same time uh, derive heavy revenues upon it. Uh, I would understand the moral argument that you mentioned but, uh, I mean, wouldn't morality be a little subjective over here? Uh, I mean, I mean, how do we really, are there frameworks to understand what is maybe very immoral or, or less than immoral? Uh, so. Yeah, uh, excellent question. So how do we relate it to, you know, various other goods which are considered uh, problematic or worth discouraging, like, you know, alcohol or drugs and, and so on. Um, well, there are similarities, but there are also very differences, right? And the thing with, let's say, drugs is that, uh, uh, or, or, or alcohol and so on, is that their production itself is, is not considered sinful, right? Nobody is harmed, nobody dies due to the production. It's the consumption part which is problematic, that, you know, people who are consuming these things, they, they suffer damages. And, and uh, so, uh, so with the elephant tusks, or maybe some other markets like you know, prostitution or something, you the the uh, it's 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 a different kind of moral problem, right? Where where the uh, the the uh, damage or the harm is happening in the act of production itself. Yes. Now, uh, you, you are right. What you said that you know. There's, there's often a debate with respect to, let's say, drugs and all that. If you, if you clamp down very heavily and ban it, you often drive it underground. So you, don't, if you, you may not be able to eliminate it. It's just that it's offering away from you know, official scrutiny. And that can lead to all kinds of problems, including government doesn't make any revenues from that, right? Um, uh, so, um, so one way to to sort of uh, bypass that is is to uh, well uh, allow it, but make it expensive by you know imposing uh, high taxes and, and so on. Uh, so so it's a good point that you know if the black market is is thriving, um, uh, and we, if you haven't succeeded in in reducing it to a great deal, uh, maybe just bring it above ground and make it as expensive. But this, this one factor that, you know, if you uh, tax heavily, <coughs> that also 
tends to send it underground, right? And then people open up a black market to avoid the taxes. So, so there may be limit to limits to which you know by uh, taxation you can try to keep the quantities down. Um, so, so that's another factor. Uh, but it's an interesting argument. So, yeah, uh, theoretically, it's possible to have situations where. Uh, you can have a bigger quantitative impact by allowing it and, and uh, putting high taxes on it. Yeah, it's, it's something to consider. Um, sir, so from like an empirical point of view, which would you say has been most successful like in, in combating this particular issue? Um, well, why don't one of you uh, tell us about that? I, I can't profess to be, you know, have, uh, 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 I, I haven't uh, sort of a comprehensive knowledge of this literature that, you know, of these various conservation strategies, uh, what are the lessons learned, which has been more expensive. See, in social sciences, this is often the problem, right? Uh, the systems we are studying are extremely complicated, yeah? Uh, and we are talking of a whole vector of policies and strategies. Uh, ideally, what you would like to do is have a lab experiment, right? Where you uh, only change one thing, one aspect of a policy, uh, hold everything else constant, you gather the data and you see you know, how, how the system is reacting, how the market is reacting, how people are reacting to, to specific changes along one dimension. Uh, in practice, you don't have the luxury of that. Right. So the great deal of uh, the challenge of an empirical economist is to use various kinds of econometric techniques to substitute for uh, the lack of a sort of lab based uh, controlled experiment. Yeah. Now, for conservation, to what extent people have been able to do it, I don't I don't know. Um, it's a very good question. I, I wish I had a better grasp of the literature to, to often people say things that um, um, yeah I'll, I'll try to look it up I'll try to look it up because you know as I showed you there are instances of both right in, in some cases the sales were allowed in some other cases they were not allowed uh, to make a clean identification out of that would be challenging but I'll, I'll try to see if, if uh, empirical economists have tried to come up with some sort of estimate of, of a comparison of these policies. So but such decisions like policy decisions usually depend from state to state or country to country on what their uh, ultimate goal is, right? For example, in this, we could do, uh, you know, the first one, allow allowing sale could be good for short term benefits, but then long term, if you really want it to be abolished, uh, probably, um, you know, like, uh, limiting the demand and all of that would be a better idea. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, see, that's, that's the kind of problem I was alluding to and rambling a little bit while I was doing it, that uh, there are all kinds of possible selection biases, right? So this is, this is sort of taking a cue from what Akriti said, but it can be taken in various directions. So for example, you know, uh, two countries applying for a sale, may have very different motives. One country may just want the money to be spent on you know, military expenditure or whatever. Uh, another country may be honestly interested in, in, in conservation and they really uh, want those funds to, to go back to, to fighting the menace of the poachers. Yet another country may suddenly find this as a profitable opportunity as one of you alluded that you know it may create actually perverse incentives for for yet another country they find oh uh, why don't we have our own poachers then capture uh, their stock uh, sell it on the market by getting the permission and so so they may secretly uh, have a secret handshake with their poachers uh, to in order to share the revenues so so that's another possibility, right? And when you look at the data and look at a few data points, you know, uh, what the motives of these countries were, how, how clean their motives were or non-clean is some, something that we have to worry about, right? That uh, 
there's there's going to be some variation over there. Um, yeah. Um, and also, you know, these things happened at different points in time. Uh, some of these sales were permitted in the 80s, some were denied in the 90s. And a lot of things were different across those time periods. So, so that's a challenge of trying to do the comparison by looking at the sale periods and the non-sale periods. Uh, but you can, you can use some variables and time trends to, to maybe control for that. Questions? Oh, so uh, I'm way over. So I'll have to stop here. Uh, in tomorrow's lecture, we'll talk about a few more applications and then we'll uh, get to the question of welfare. Okay. So since I'm over time, yeah, I'll, I'll stop it here now and let you go on to your next uh, appointment.